ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of the testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. You know, the imagery here is kind of terrifying. And to uh, have our Christmas service, you know, start with this message, uh, it's going to be an interesting service, because uh, truthfully, uh, you know, when we think of heaven, you know, we don't think of a violent battle taking place, right? And when we think of the baby Jesus, uh, we don't think about the violent spiritual battle that happens for our, our salvation, for our souls, right? Um, but the message here is crystal clear. There is a spiritual battle on earth, and we can have victory over that battle. So let's read verse 11 again. It says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. You know, these three elements show us how the victory was won and how the victory is won today. And today we have the pleasure of three powerful young men who are going to take each one of those sections and explain to us how that applies to us today. because. The battle rages, but the victory is ours, right? So we're going to have Jamie lead us off, and he's going to talk about the blood of the Lamb, what that means to him, and how uh, the blood of Jesus has given us salvation, has given us victory over Satan and his schemes. Uh, we have Terry will be coming up next. He's going to talk about the word of their testimony, um, you know, what God's word, how God's word brings victory to us, how it separates all the confusion. Uh, we know that Satan loves to confuse us, right? But God's word brings us back, focuses right back to the truth. And uh, so Terry's going to share about that to help us with that. And finally, Bryce will wrap it up with a powerful message about not shrinking back, not shrinking back from death, not loving our lives so much that we don't do God's will. And um, so I think uh, it's a great opportunity for us to really uh, to look at that baby Jesus uh, in the cradle, but also uh, to realize that 33 years later, uh, what happened is what we really celebrate and what we are grateful for and uh, what brought salvation to us. So I'm going to turn it over to Jamie and uh, we'll have a great sermon here. Perfect. Thank you so much, Bob. And uh, good morning, my joyous and victorious friends and family. You know, with, Christ with Christmas approaching, we have much to celebrate about, right? Uh, this is a time to unite with those closest to us, you know, our closest relatives, our closest friends, and it's a time to eat, you know, to laugh together. Uh, but more importantly, it, it truly is a time to be grateful, be grateful for all the blessings God has poured out unto us. And we know that the greatest of which being the gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Please turn with me to 1 John in chapter 1. And now we know that joy comes from the Lord, amen? And it's because we are united that we can better understand. But here in 1 John, I want to I wanna shed some light on what that truly means. So let's pick it up in here in 1 John, starting in verse 4. 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 4. And the Bible reads, we write this to make our joy complete. And we'll stop right there. They're writing this to make your joy complete. So what we're about to read is pretty important here, amen? Because <laughs> I want to find out what makes joy complete. And uh, so I did a little bit of research, right? And uh, so the, the Greek for the word joy is chara, chara, which means cheerfulness or calm delight. Now, not to be mistaken with happiness, because happiness can be fleeting, right? It can, it can fluctuate. It, it's temporary. But, but this C-H-A-R-A, hara joy, 
we know it comes from the Lord, which is a, a different type of 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 uh, sensation we we can experience, right? But here, let's uh let's continue on. So we'll pick it up in verse five, and we'll read all the way to verse seven. And the Bible reads, "This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you: God is light; in Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him." And yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. My one and only point for you is the joy of the fellowship. You know, I grew up living under my parents' household all my life, 20 years. I'm 21, amen? <laughs> it's interesting because the day after my 21st birthday was the day I moved to the brother's household in the New Jersey region. And uh, I, I did uh, become officially a part of the church in 2019. I'm grateful to God that I was finally able to meet him in his entirety. Um, but, you know, upon arriving to the brother's household, you know, I, I felt a little out of place, <laughs> you know, there, everyone, there, everyone there was older than me and a working man, you know, uh, I, on the other hand, had just left school out of work and I moved out of my parents' place, which I was so accustomed to for my whole life. Um, but I did it because I knew, I knew God was calling me. I didn't really understand what I was getting into, <laughs> but I knew God was calling me, amen. And uh, so you, you give it some time uh, after living there for about three quarters of a year, I learned some valuable things. And these are some, there's four, four things that I want to share with you from what I learned at my experience at uh, living in a household filled with godly men. The first of which is we devote ourselves or we devoted ourselves to the apostles teachings. And what did that, what does that mean? What did that look like? Well, we read the Bible together. We studied the Bible with others together. You know, we went to church together. We sang together. We lived for God together. That's John 3.30. The second thing we devoted ourselves to was prayer. We prayed for each other's families. We prayed for those studying the Bible. We prayed for goals and visions. We prayed in the morning and at night. We even prayed before and after meals. Amen. The double blessing, that double portion. <laughs> we prayed continually, and that's in First Thessalonians 5.17. The third thing we devoted ourselves to was the breaking of bread. We reflected on the cross together. We shed some pain-filled tears. We carried each other's burdens, and we took communion together in remembrance of Jesus. That's Luke 22.19. And this final thing I want to hone in on. The last thing that we devoted ourselves to was the fellowship. I love the fellowship. Amen. <laughs> There's nothing like it. I mean, we laughed together. We worked out together. I mean, we checked up on each other. We encouraged each other. We just loved each other. And we know that's John 13, 34 through 35. Now, I'm going to keep it real. I'd be lying if I said that all was well all the time. You know, all was roses and daisies. I'd be lying if I said that. But even through the tough times, we got through because of one thing only. We walked in the light together. When a brother was in sin, you knew immediately. Why? Because when you live with someone, you learn who they are very quickly. Now, let me tell you about how Satan works. When you're in sin, you try to disguise it. And if you're like me, you might have tried to compare it, try to minimalize it. You know, you might try to convince yourself that it's not that bad. You may even try to ignore it. But the truth is, it never goes away. The longer you carry your sin, the more obvious it becomes. That's Galatians 5.19. And that's something I had to learn the hard way. You know, it, it, see, the dangerous thing about carrying sin is that it, it limits and even prohibits your devotion to God. And there are four key things we need to be devoted to here. But here, let me explain. You see, 
when you're when you're in sin, your mind is distracted and your heart is pulled away from God. And, and now, if your heart is pulled away from God, then that means your heart is also pulled away from your brothers and sisters, from your wife or husband, even from the people who care for you deeply, from your spiritual parents. I had to learn that the hard way. I had to confess immediately because the longer I held on to my sin, the worse it became. And just to share a bit with you, I struggled a lot with you know, my pride, my arrogance, my laziness, my lack of discipline in my schedule. I struggled with my purity. I was wrestling with God for so long because I just could not figure out. I just, I couldn't, I, I couldn't embrace what he was calling me to do. I was just at this internal turmoil for so long and it led to a, a plethora of, of sins to my shame. And there were times where I would confess immediately and there were times where I would hold on to it for too long and it would just get worse and worse and eat me alive. And I mean, the, the truth is the longer I held on to it, the, the worse it got. It took a mental toll, a physical and spiritual one as well. Even to the point of death. And that's Matthew 26, 38. But here's the beauty in it all. When I was at my lowest, God used my brothers to get me back up. I was never judged. I was loved. It wasn't until I was completely open, completely clean, that I was able to focus on God. And, <laughs> and once I was able to focus on God, I was able to see the blessings that he had in store for me. He handed me a job <laughs> when I needed it most. He taught me how to love others better from living in that household and you know studying the Bible with so many people. He gave me an absolutely astronomical girlfriend who is completely out of my league, amen. <laughs> but uh, I was able to just focus on him and I was just able to see all the opportunities he's given me. I was able to see just, the, just his love being poured out from everywhere, but that the sin was blinding me from it all. So to conclude, I, I truly believe that if you hold on to any little bit of sin, as small as it is, it is preventing you from fully being devoted to God. So my only challenge is this get clean confess everything to your closest spiritual family member whether that be your spiritual parents or your closest brother or sister in the kingdom get all the ugly get all the nasty out please get it out i promise you jesus promises you that you will be able to focus on his will you will you will see firsthand his light for your life and i you will see how the fellowship between you and your brothers and sisters will be magnified, how your love will be amplified. And to finish out, I just want to read this one scripture here. In 1 John chapter 1, and let's just drop it down to verse 9. The scripture simply says, if we confess, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let's go after it and let's watch God be faithful and be a God of his word. Thank you and amen. <clears throat> wow, bro. That was absolutely amazing. <sighs> well, good morning, church. I'd like for you guys to turn over to John 5. While you guys are turning over there, looking back at the verse um, for today, it says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So I'm going to be honest. English has not really been my strong suit. I mean, sometimes I can struggle to understand words, spell them, even pronounce them. You can ask Mari. I'll be blabbering on the PlayStation. Sometimes I don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> so how about this? 
Let's go up and, and look up what testimony means. It says, a testimony is evidence or proof provided by the existence or appearance of something. Okay. So if we break that down then, that pretty much says that testimony basically proves whether something is true or real. Interesting. So then, biblically, what will we be trying to prove is real or true? What or who needs to be brought to others and shown that is the truth or real? Let's check in John 5, 31 to 34. It reads, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it so that you may be saved. The title of my lesson today, guys, is Bear Witness to the Second Key of Salvation. If you haven't noticed, the three points that Jamie, Bryce, and I are going to go over are ways to beat Satan. Did you hear that? Beat Satan. At the beginning of the verse 11, it says, they triumph over him. Come on, guys. I think we all want to triumph over Satan. So as we see in John 5, biblical testimonies about Jesus. Jesus says that he knows that what testimonies about him are true. He also says that they are the truth. Guys, you have to understand that true testimonies about Jesus show everything that he is about. They show the forgiveness, the love, the passion, the struggles, and the change that Jesus truly came to bring to this world. How do we know this? Well, if we look at the best testimony known to man, what do you think that is? The Bible. The whole Bible is a testimony about Jesus, his life, his goals for mankind. It says in 1 John 5, 9, we accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which is given about his son. The whole Bible is God's word, and he uses his word to talk about his one and only son. I have one point for today. It is called sharing salvation. We must share our salvation about Jesus. I mean, we must share our testimony about Jesus because with Jesus, we can fight off any forces of evil. With Jesus, you aren't focused on the world. You don't rely on your own strength and hate melts away. The point of our testimonies, as it said in John 5 and 1 John 5, is to save others. Human testimonies are necessary and accepted because they do save people. They wake people up and allow them to truly see where they are at. Is your testimony waking someone up? Um, let me talk about two weeks ago at a Friday Night Devo. Um, Jordan Swan had us, um, just all the brothers get pick up like random scriptures that the sisters gave to us. And then we just had to preach a sermonette right off it. Now, let me tell you, um, it, that <laughs> it was way more difficult than, than it sounds. Like, we literally had like five minutes as someone else was going to go and do it. And then as the brothers are going off, like, bro, the brothers were amazing. I don't know how we have so many fired young Christians being able to just go out and preach the word. Um, as I go on, I don't remember what I was talking about, but I do remember that I was sharing about just how this year has been a struggle for me. And like just not even the past few weeks I've been going through mental just lock and everything. Like I really, I was just like trying to keep myself away from talking to people and keeping myself almost away from the church. And then after getting open and talking about that and then like just explaining like what I was going through. After I finished, this girl who was new onto the Devo she had, someone had invited her out. She unmuted herself and she said, after today, I want to start studying the Bible. 
just hearing that and seeing like how much opening up and talking about what the word in my life changed her perspective and wanted, had her want to go and chase after God is, it's amazing. It shows that we, us opening our mouths really does change people. And then let me talk about Mark. I feel like I talk about Mark all the time, but <laughs> yo, Mark is my best friend. And it's just, I don't think Amari would be where he's at now if I didn't open my mouth and ask him about coming out to church. And it took it would, took a lot. Literally, I would speak about it and then I wouldn't say nothing. <laughs> I would speak about it, wouldn't say nothing. But it was the fact that Amari saw the changes in my life. He saw the things that I was doing. And when I actually built up the courage to truly ask him to start studying the Bible, he was like, yeah, sure. And he told me that he just saw so much, like, it was like, I just, out of the blue, was just baptized. I was going to Devo's and everything. And it just showed how much change I had in just over a year. And just seeing, like, the, the change in Amari. And I didn't realize so much stuff that he was going through at school. But to be able to help him come to Christ and rebuild his connection with God, that's seen him as dumb blessings to not only his mental, but just his trust and his love for everybody. I have one practical. Share your faith. And when I say this, I don't mean how you've been doing it for the first 11 months of the year. I mean with passion, as if that person's life depends on it. Your testimony should be just as emotional as your last words to someone. You could be the deciding factor in a person's salvation and you're not emotional about it? Get out of here. If you, if you could save somebody's life, wouldn't you want to do it? I have two challenges. If you haven't had a visitor or haven't been fruitful in a while, I challenge you to reevaluate how you are sharing your faith and how you are doing Bible studies. For 31 days, starting now, when you are sharing your faith, give it your all. Put your whole heart into each person you're sharing with, you're studying with, or discipling. If you aren't feeling sad, angry, like just emotionally tired after someone, after you're going after somebody and you're just, oh my goodness, I had to do like two studies back to back. I'm so tired. Oh, we, she had like 50 questions, but she, she said she still want to study. Look, after you put in all your heart and your emotions after that, and that person is going to come after it, because they're going to see what you're doing. And they're going to be like, all right, I'm, if they're going to keep putting all their heart into this, then I have to. Trust me. Second challenge. Relook at your past and now. Fall back in love with what Jesus has done for you. And then do that every time you get a chance. When something comes up in life, and Jesus helps you through it, boast about it. Share how much Jesus is doing in your life whenever you can. Why are you hiding what Jesus is doing for you? When if Listening to Jamie and just hearing just how much the brothers helped him in the household, that's amazing. That just shows that when we keep stuff to ourselves, it doesn't help. But when we go out and we talk, and we go to our brothers and we get love, it really helps us. So that also means that when Jesus is helping you and you say something about it, it's going to help somebody else. Because there could be someone else that was in the same position that she was in and they, they just didn't say nothing about it. We got saved because we believe in God's testimony about Jesus. And with that, we battle Satan every day. If we share our testimony and get others to believe in God's testimony, we will have an army to fight and conquer Satan. God be all the glory. Hey Amen. Thank you, Terry. Well, I want to read you guys something interesting here. Now, check this out. We've read, uh, Bob read Revelations 12, right? He read Revelations 12, 
and with one through 11, right? But check this out. This is the message version of that scripture. In Revelations 12, it says in verse 11 in the message version, it says they defeated him through the blood of the lamb and the bold word of their witness. They weren't in love with themselves. They were willing to die for Christ. I mean, just think about that for a minute, right? They, were, they weren't in love with their lives, but they were willing to die for Christ. My title of my lesson is Die So That Others Will Live. Die So That Others Will Live. That my first and only point is die so that others will live. Fair enough, right? Now, I, I made a little picture, I, I, I do a little doodle here, right? Now, my daughter can't draw yet, and I, I'm looking forward to when she can. But I, I you know, I, I doodled this morning, and I know I'm not an artist, uh, but I doodled because, you know, I thought about it like, wow, like, you know, during Christmas, we're like kids, right? We were supposed to be like kids. We think about the gifts that we receive, but also the joy that we have, this, the time, the family that we have. And I thought, well, as kids, you know, we the kids have so much joy. They have so much life into in, in them, right? But they also have so much, like, inspiration around them, right? I mean, they, they look, they turn on the TV and they look at heroes like Superman and Batman and all these different characters that they, they want to be like, right? Um, you know, when I was a kid, I thought about, well, who did I want to be like? Well, I, I looked at like men like Martin Luther King, you know, Malcolm X. I, I thought about, you know, like John F. Kennedy. I, I thought about the women like Mother Teresa, you know, Gandhi. Like I thought about these, these people who were willing to give up themselves. And then, you know, it's something, something interesting happened. When I, when I became a disciple, when I got baptized, my heroes changed. It was no longer those heroes and they were great, but the hero of heroes was Jesus Christ. You know, you don't believe me? Turn to John chapter 10. Now this is before Jesus goes to the cross and the, the sacrifice that it took, right? Just to get out of yourself, to be willing to die for people that, you know, you'll never meet. You know, as you turn to John chapter 10, I was looking at, okay, what is a real, what is a hero? And it says a real hero is, is someone who gets up even when he can't. A hero is someone who does what must be done and needs no other reason. A hero you want to be one for those rare human beings who make history rather than merely watch it flow around them like water around a rock. You see, why is Jesus a hero? In John chapter 10, in verse 17, it says, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. Wow. Jesus literally laid his life down. Didn't have to be told to, to lay it down, but willingly sacrificed himself so that others could live. You know, for you this morning, what makes a hero? What makes a hero? Jesus was a hero, but he this, this is not the most inspirational part, right? If you go to Luke chapter 9, you'll see something more inspirational than that, right? And, and you, you're thinking, well, what's more inspirational than Jesus dying on the cross? In Luke 9, in verse 23, the Bible reads, in verse 23, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to lose his life or whoever wants to save his life will lose it. 
but whoever loses his life for me will save it. So what's the miraculous thing? What's the most inspirational thing we can have, right? Is the ability, Jesus gives us the ability to be like heroes each and every day, right? We don't have to wait. We are literally, God literally arms us to be like heroes to individuals whom we will see and may never see in our lifetime. But God gives us the opportunity to be heroes each and every day. You know, I was watching this movie, um, Rwanda, Hotel Rwanda. And I was so inspired by this, the, the main character, Paul, who at the beginning, he, he loved his family. He takes care of his family. He, he does all these favors for the, 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 you know, those who he felt like, well, they'll take care of me when things go bad in, here in Africa, right? And this is in the middle of uh, uh, what would soon be a genocide. And yet in the movie, you see his transition from the character who sacrifices only for his family to a guy who willingly sacrifices for those around him. You know, it's one fun fact. When I actually look at the story, he saved over a thousand people alone. Like alone, just a thousand people. He was willing to lay down his life so that, because he saw the injustice around him and he was willingly willing to act. My question for you today is, are you willing to act? You know, this week was really hard. You know, the scripture in Revelations where it says shrinking back, it really played a part in me. You know, I was given a charge to preach the word this morning. And on, and on, uh, on Wednesday, my daughter got sick. She got sick and um, she had a, a hundred degree temperature. And I, God has been giving me so many miracles, right? Six people studying the Bible. You know, I, I, I've been blessed to have the opportunity to, to lead a Bible talk with my wife. And so many great things have happened, but I wanted to shrink back. I couldn't bear watching my daughter suffer. So I thought, well, I should shrink back. I should, I should push myself to the side. You know, these studies, well, they'll, they'll happen. But, you know, I need to take care of my family. And rightfully so, I need to take care of my family. But in those moments, in the painful moments, are you still willing to lay your life down for people? I took care of my daughter with my wife. And then I, on Saturday, I was willing to, 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 to get with whomever and talk with whomever to study, right? Why? Because we, we hurt, but the world is hurting just as much as we are. You know, that's something I've been learning this last year is I hurt, but others are hurting just as much. And I can't take a step back. You know, some of us were sitting in a shallow end waiting for a hero to come. And Jesus is saying, get up, wake up. You're that hero. You know, I, I'm so inspired by Sasha because she prayed for her mother endlessly. And her mother got baptized. I'm so inspired by Kim sharing her story because that's, that's a hero right there. She's going through pain, but she's willing to lay her life down. You know, I think about the Thomases lost their son. And every year they talk about the story as commemoration for the pain they suffered, but how God worked. God is working. When you think about it, you just need to look back and see how God has worked in your life. I have one practical for you guys today. I want everyone today to sit down and to write a list. What has God done for me this year? What has God done for me this year? You know, it's funny when you look at a list, you look at all the things that have happened, like great things that God has done, even in the midst of challenges, you, you realize that it's not about you anymore. You realize that it's all about Jesus. You know, as I, as I get ready to close and I, and I share the challenge with you, I want to share 
a, a couple of numbers here with you. And I, and I, and I think about this, you know, the Holocaust was a terrible tragedy. Six million people, six million Jews lost their lives. In Africa, that, that genocide I was talking about, over 800,000 people lost their lives. In the pandemic, when over 1 million people have lost their lives. Now, this doesn't, this doesn't, each of these tragedies deserves their own separate spot because they're all important in history. But we have to realize something, that all of these tragedies, they're meant to wake us up. Guys, it is not about us anymore. Every one of you has a story to tell. Every one of you can be a hero to someone. The only question you gotta ask yourself is, how much more time are you gonna let go by? How much more time are you gonna let go by and not be a hero? A hero can be anyone. A hero can be that person who shares his faith, brings one person out. A hero can be someone who's going to snatch a brother or sister from the flames late at night because they know that they won't make it the next day. A hero can be any one of us. We just need to step up. And I think about, in closing, I think about Mark, Mark Hare. There was a brother that you knew was super dedicated. He was dedicated, he loved God. And if you asked him, if you asked him, would he do it again to know that he would die? He would tell you probably, yeah, he would tell you yes because he didn't regret what he did for his life. Are you holding on regrets? My challenge for us as we close out is how much time are we gonna waste? Syracuse Church, we are not the church, the little church that can't, could. We are the little, the little church that will become the big church that can and will. And so my challenge to you, stop wasting time, let's get up, Let's get moving and let's go be heroes to the world. Thank you. I love you. To God be the glory. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. All three of you guys did a great job. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I noticed there was like a common thread there. And, you know, two of the guys talked about waking other people up. And then Jamie talked about pulling, being pulled up by his brothers. And, you know, to me, that shows that uh, really our faith, it, no matter what we're looking at, our faith is about helping other people to know God, right? Uh, you know, I appreciate Jamie's point about the joy of fellowship, um, that the brothers that surrounded him helped him uh, to overcome all of those challenges and over uh, that he could see that um, how sin was prohibiting his growth and how it prohibits all of us. And, and it really causes people to... Uh, uh, really just shut down. And by being open and uh, trusting the brothers and letting the brothers pray together and, uh, you know, just encourage one another, that, that's what kept him strong and helped him. So I really appreciate your message, Jamie. Uh, it's great to really realize how much we need each other. And especially, you know, we're doing it over Zoom right now. Uh, but, you know, let's pray that uh, by the end of the year, we'll be all back together. And, uh, but Either way, uh, we need each other. We're able to connect, whether it's through Zoom or personally, we need to be there for each other. That's what's so important to fellowship. Uh, Terry, your message about uh, God's word, the word of testimony, you know, I just appreciate so much, you know, just talking about how God's word uh, really was the basis. And, it, and when we uh, share our faith, um, it's not really our word, it's God's word that we're sharing and we're helping other people, um, you know, and... Uh, I appreciate, you know, you said at one point, you said that uh, when you share with people, when you get God's word in their life and help to soften their outlook on life, because we know people, even what Diane mentioned earlier, how people can be a little bit hard, a little bit, you know, edgy. And, uh, and yet uh, what Terry said was fantastic. He said how God's word will help melt that hate away. That was awesome. You know, and it's so true. And uh, Bryce, your message today, you know, it's great just about, you know, perseverance. You know, even in, you know, and I know, believe me, uh, you know, when your child is hurting, uh, you want to just give up everything and focus and zoom in on them and uh, just whatever you need to do. And, uh, and yet, uh, you know, you kept your, uh, your faith and kept your strength and persevered 
realizing that God was in control. And, um, you know, it's just a great example about uh, denying ourselves and, uh, and putting others first, realizing what, what we're what we're all about is, uh, you know, we have God's word. We have the blood of the lamb. Uh, we have the knowledge of what it, what happens when we shrink back. Uh, but when we take that and put it into action and help others, um, you know, that's what it's all about. And that's what, uh, you know, God is calling us to, you know, not just keep our light under a lamp, but to bring it to the world. And, uh, you know, so you guys did a great job. I really appreciate you, all of your messages. And uh, we're going to close out with a fun uh, Christmas song here. Uh, but uh, once again, just a Merry Christmas to everyone. Thank you for being with us today. We're going to have an awesome song. And uh, I love you guys. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Hey, everybody. We're going to sing.